You walked with me down a dusty path over crinkling cellophane wrappers of cigarette packs and shredded bits of paint-stained flannel shirt. You took your hand out of your denim jacket and knit your fingers into mine. Comfort stacked on comfort. Rays from the sun streamed over the knot of our grasp. Warmth seeped into my arm, up my shoulder, and loaded my torso with a store that sopped up the knowing that it was cold outside. I didn't need, I didn't need my hat so long as the wind didn't pick up. There was no destination. We simply walked. Our steps fell into wider and longer oscillations, testing the boundaries of our tether. I spread my fingers and straightened my back as I came to a stop. I let your hand fall as I reached into my coat, and you rested your palm reassuringly on my shoulder. Why are you carrying a jar in your coat? you asked. Oh, well, I stalled. It was an eight ounce canning jar I bought for myself used from a thrift store. Eleven jars were wedged in a water-stained box that used to hold Kimmy's cocktail glasses. Just two dollars for the bunch. I gently tapped the rust-feckled lid, pulled it all of the way out, held it above both of our heads. Branches of trees bent and danced through the warped glass surface as I turned my jar in the sunlight. A chalky white film was gathered at the base of the raised letters W-I-S-E. Spikes and shards shot out of a faint blue shaft of energy in the center of my jar. Tickling fingers of tiny lightning streaks traced my hand with the same living warmth that we had given each other moments before while holding hands. I pulled my jar close to my chest, left hand low in the glass, right hand high in the lid. The ridged edges dug into the meat of my drumstick thumb. My calloused fingers tested the tension of the lid. You gonna open it? You asked. Not now, I said. If I open it now, the energy will escape and the magic will be gone. I transferred the jar to my right hand and reached out for yours with my left as we walked again. The sides of my nostrils threatened to freeze together as I breathed in a long, slow breath. My warm exhale provided a thaw. I smiled as I contemplated having to breathe only with my mouth if my nose was permanently shut. In the back of Boy's Life magazine, when I was 12 years old, I saw an ad for a plasma globe, I said. What's a plasma globe, you asked. Oh, it's a glass ball, about the size of a soccer ball, I said. It has a plastic hexagon box at the base and an electrode sticking out rising to the middle of the glass ball. There is some special gas inside the ball and when it's on, tiny wisps of energy make a connection between the electrode and glass. Just like your jar, he said. Yes, pretty much just like my jar here, I said. When I was 14, I got a ride to Oak Park Mall and saw a plasma globe at Spencer's gift shop. Earlier that summer, I had started caddying and was making good money. I had enough to buy the globe, and there it was, right in front of me. I bought it and carried it home. The strange thing about this memory, I explained to you, is that it isn't a memory at all. I am placing the power of my thoughts right now into the mind of myself as that 12-year-old boy. It is compelling him to find the advertisement, to make the money, to venture all the way to the shopping mall, I said. How, you asked. I'm getting to that, I said. 
This conjuring is an answer for that boy. He was crying for help. Why did you cry for help? He said. Remember how I had told you that I was so lonely back then? I said as you nodded. I felt like I had no way out. It was bad. One time, like so many other times, my mother was on top of me, beating my head and chest, screaming at me. I don't remember words, just angry screaming. My sister came up behind her and pleaded with her to stop. My mom kept at it. So, my sister kicked her in the back and knocked her over. We ran out of our house as our mom cried in pain. Get away is all I could think. We ran until the screeching of our mom couldn't be heard anymore. I wondered what the people inside each house must be thinking as we passed. We never found out. Nobody came to the front door. Nobody ever came to the front door. My sister and I crouched behind a big air conditioner that smelled like a wet dog. It was next to a house at the end of our block. Our mother was calling both of our names from her car. She was driving up and down our street, screaming our names and demanding that we come home. Never did it occur to either of us to leave our hiding place and return home with her. We'd both get beat, and more severely than before. No, we'd wait until she calmed down, passed out, fell asleep. Damn. I stopped walking, handed you the jar. You switched it to your left hand and put your right hand back into mine, and we kept walking down the path. I continued with my conjuring. At school, my classmates would give a recap of the night before watching Little House in the Prairie or playing at a friend's house two blocks over. I never considered talking about how my mom played hide and seek with my sister and I while balancing a vodka Gibson in one hand and a steering wheel and a Merit cigarette in the other. I didn't talk about my weekend. At least, I didn't talk about what really happened. Instead, I used to break out Bill Murray's drill sergeant monologue from the movie Stripes, word for word. I used a tape recorder to record that bit of the movie so I could commit it to memory. I drew a picture of a clown outfit once, rubber nose, big shoes, floppy collar, baggy pants, with nobody in it, just the costume. But you hate clowns, you said. You're right. That's weird, I said. Well, I wrote a poem underneath the clown picture and titled it The Funny Guy. It was about how I used humor to cover up my discomfort. How, being strange, I could deflect questions from other people. I chose to be awkward and uncomfortable on my own terms for something that I did rather than for something that was done to me. I folded up that piece of paper with the picture and the poem and I wedged it into a crack inside my closet between the door jam and the wall. My hope was that one day someone would find it and send help. Did anyone find it? Did anyone help you? You asked. No, I said. Not then. But eventually, I did get help. 
I did get away. And it's okay. Because here I am, 32 years later, sending love and wisdom. And I nodded to the jar in your hands, back in time to myself. I am answering that frightened boy's call for help. And I look from the jar to your face. I'm here to help you. I love you. Then you opened your jar. <laughs>